Welcome to Brooklands as ever, and thank you for being here and supporting the Trust. I'm Steve Clark. Um, firstly, let me welcome all those people from the current HWM facility in Walton on Thames. Great to see you here, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm a reasonably happy person. <laughs> Doesn't take much, no. Um, we suddenly realised at about quarter to seven we didn't have the slides loaded. So that was a good start. And then, as you saw, we had a little bit of a technical problem earlier on. But we're here in a wonderful setting. We've got a fascinating subject to discuss. And we've got two of the best motoring journalists in the world. Will you please welcome Simon Taylor and Steve Crockley. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here, as Steve says. Um, it is my very pleasant job to uh, introduce you to Simon Taylor. Now, I, I guess four-fifths and nine-tenths of you know exactly who Simon Taylor is, but you may not know the full story, so I'm just going to give you a, a quick briefing. Simon is indeed one of the world's finest motoring journalists, editor of Autosport at 23, rose through the kind of grubby uh, uh, streets of publishing to become the boss of a publishing, the best publishing company in, in Britain, Haymarket, uh, was on the way publisher of magazines like What Car and Classic and Sports Car, was my boss, rescued me from a, from a ailing business and set me on the right road, <clears throat> which I feel I'm still on. Oh, you're the one for that. And, um, uh, was also the, obviously the BBC voice of motorsport, mainly F1. And as you know, I hope, he had a cameo role in the Louder versus Hunt movie called Rush, where he was, and this is the truth, he was the first guy with the, what, what will we say, the gonads to actually make the announcement that Hunt was indeed the world champion. And that is quite a, quite a leap of faith, as, a, as, as he would, as I think, in, on this very forum he's already told. <coughs> But tonight he's here as the author of a fine book, or two book, uh, sorry, a two volume book called, now I get this wrong, J John George and the HWMs, I was right. thinking all day, there it was. Um, it's, a no, it's, it's an enormous book, it's, it started out as being what he thought was going to be three months work, it turned out to be rather a lot more than that, 600 photographs, 580 odd pages, but we'll get into that in a minute. But it's all about HWM, a tiny local racing car company that 
was first after the war to fly the British flag on, on international racetracks. Um, so what I want to do, what I want to hear is uh, is exactly how this came about. Let's start at the very beginning, Simon, and say, why did you write this book? Well. My first motivation was selfish. Um, I bought an HWM about 20 years ago, which I still have, which uh, was going to be parked outside this evening, but wasn't able to be. But there are uh, two wonderful HWMs outside, which I hope you've seen. Um, and inevitably, when you own a car yourself, you want to know a bit about the history. I knew that HWM was a brave little team that had raced um, internationally in the late 40s and early 50s. But I didn't really know very much about them. And choose any racing team, choose any racing driver, choose any uh, racing organization, and there's been at least one book about it. Many teams and drivers have had scores of books written about them. But amazingly, nobody had ever written about HWM. And in fact, the team was pretty much forgotten. Apart from anoraks like me, nobody really knew about HWM. Some of them knew that there was a very successful Aston Martin dealership, which had been there forever, uh, just by the bridge at Walton-on-Thames. But they didn't know that in that very building, there had been a racing team which was running in Formula One and Formula Two, and at a time when there was no other British team that could actually get going. BRM, much vaunted, much publicised, took a huge amount of money out of the British motor industry and out of individuals who sent them donations. But the car never worked. The V16 BRM was a huge failure. And while all that was going on, with big headlines everywhere, almost unnoticed, this little team from Walton on Thames, running on an absolute shoestring. They had no money. They had a car that was pretty crude, made mainly out of production car parts. They had overworked, underpaid mechanics, and not very many of them, working seven days and seven nights a week. And the reason why the book took so long and became so fascinating to me was that this isn't just a matter of a team going to races and running in the races and either coming seventh or retiring or whatever it may be. It's actually the story of human endeavor on no money and actually managing for six, seven, eight years to be an important racing team and have results far above what they deserve to have when it looked at, at budgets. They were punching above their weight. And the two men who were running this thing were charismatic and most intriguing until, of course, in 1956, one of them was killed in the Mealy Melia, and then basically the team uh, shuddered to a halt. I wanted to know more about this. I burrowed around for nearly 10 years doing the research, and the result was the book that I had to write, but it took a long time. I heard you telling somebody the other day that you thought it was a shame that you had to deliver to the publisher because you could have just done another year, <coughs> right? Well, I think everybody's like that. I mean, you talk to racing car design, uh, you talk to road car designers all the time. You were with Bill Ford the day before yesterday. And any uh, motor manufacturer, any designer will always say to you, well, we had to get the thing in the showroom, but if I could have had another six months, we would have worked a little bit on the rear suspension geometry it's true. or whatever it's true. it would be. So I'm, I'm sort of 99% happy with the book, but uh, perhaps the rear suspension geometry could have had a little bit of a tweak. Could you uh, tell us about the, the protagonists? There were two important men in this. Could you tell us where they came from, how they got together, and what their, what their sort of aim was. Certainly. Well, interestingly, they both were extremely local. They were both local boys. Um, John Heath was the man that really got the thing underway. And he was six foot three, very intense, very hardworking, very ruthless with anybody who wasn't going to work 
24 hours a day like he wanted to work, was eager to pay as little money as he possibly could. There's one quote in the book where one of the mechanics, having worked an 18-hour day for the fourth night in, in a row, went to John Heath and said, Mr Heath, do you think you could pay us a little bit of overtime? And John Heath said, I can't pay overtime. Tell you what I'll do. I'll give you, every time you work late, I'll give you a packet of fish and chips and ten woodbines. <laughs> <coughs> and that was the overtime. So that was John Heath. If you like, he sort of had ideas above his station. He was actually quite aristocratic. He was a baron, although he never used the title because he said it doesn't go with somebody in the workshop with grease under their fingernails. But um, he had ideas above his budget, if you like. He wanted, he did race, but it wasn't so much the racing that he was interested in. He wanted to build a little British team. He had a garage business here, uh, well, Walton on Thames and Hersham, um, before the war, but only in a pretty small way. He worked as an engineer in the war, and just after the war, immediately after the war, at a rather significant little dinner party, he met George Abacassis. Now, George Abacassis was very different from John Heath in that he was extremely um, elegant, smooth, beautifully dressed, would never dream of getting gre grease under his fingernails. But he was also a very good racing driver, and he had raced before the war with quite a lot of success. He was a sort of up-and-coming young racer. And if the war hadn't happened, um, he, I think, would have gone on to greater things with Wirtz teams. Instead, he had a very dramatic war. He was um, in bomber command uh, and did all sorts of brave things. Um, and in the end, was shot down on an extraordinary mission. He was flying at a 1,000 feet with no bombs aboard. He was in a Stirling bomber because he was dropping supplies over Denmark to the Danish resistance. And unfortunately, he'd had a lot of narrow escapes before then, but a Messerschmitt got him, shot him down, and he spent the rest of the war in Stalag Luft III, which is the German prisoner of war camp. If any of you have seen the film The Great Escape, uh, which is not particularly fictionalised, a lot of that is true, and that happened in that prisoner of war camp. In the book, I was able to find, <coughs> this is why research takes so long, I was able to find facsimiles given to me by George Abacassi's family of the notebook that he kept while he was in a prisoner of war camp. This is going off motor racing, but it's so fascinating, I had to put it in the book. Uh, and he, he, he was a very clever draftsman. He drew sketches of the inside of the prison camp. And his main, two main overriding feelings were hunger and boredom. He had one potato a day, that was the, Russian, the rations, um, and he had nothing to do. And before the war, he'd been quite a bon viveur. He liked to have good dinners and go around with society in London. So he listed out in the back of this pathetic little notebook with a blunt pencil. Because he was hungry, he listed out all the best restaurants in London that he could remember. And then he wrote out menus, all the marvellous foods that they had. <coughs> well, finally, he, uh, the war ended. He came home, and his wife made him a little dinner party for a few friends. Um, of course, that was, there was rationing then, so it still wasn't particularly good food, but it was more than one potato. So at this little dinner party, his wife had asked local people, and one of them was John Heath. And John Heath and George Abacassis talked at that dinner party in July 1945, and they agreed between them. George wanted to get back to motor racing. John had this ambition to run a racing team. And there was a building near Walton Bridge, which had, a big brick building, which had been used by Vickers during the war to make parts for the Lancaster bombers that were then completed here. And that building was redundant when the war ended, and John and George took it over. 
and ran their little motor business from there and ran the racing team from there. They were trying to pay for the racing team by selling petrol from the pumps and buying and selling <coughs> Ford Populars and Morris Hates and anything else they could get their hands on. And that same building, somewhat facelifted, it has to be said, but that same building is where HWM are still operating and will sell you an Aston Martin for a mere £200,000. I think Andrew Harting is in the room. See him afterwards and he'll be happy to sell you an Aston. <laughs> and, and that, ladies and gentlemen, gives you a flavour of the book because it isn't just a, a litany of, of race results or anything like that. It's a, it's a, a, a fascinating look at, at the way people were and how they felt and what motivated them in those, in those years. And, it, and it's a, a real tribute to Simon's thoroughness. Um, so, Simon, how did, they must have had some money. Where did, where, did, where did the dosh come from, if any? Well, you know, they didn't. Um, <clears throat> the way motor racing worked in those days was if you went, not if you went to um, a little British meeting where you were expected to turn up uh, at your own expense, and a lot of the people in motor racing in those days were rather public school and rather well off, and were racing for fun. Um, and then there might be a few kind of grubbier um, people who had their own little garage and made their own little car. If you went abroad, you could find a race meeting that would pay you start money. Now, start money worked on this basis. You went to the race organisers and you said, right, I've got three cars, and I can bring them all to your race. Uh, how much will you pay me? Because obviously the race organisers were trying to put on a show for the public. And you would have a haggle with the race organisers and in the end they would say, well, we'll give you 200 quid a car. So you would go to the race meeting, you would get your 600 quid for your three cars and that money was absolutely essential because you had no money left to put petrol in the tanks of the trucks and indeed petrol in the racing cars to get you to the next race. And the way John Heath operated was that he would make out uh, contacts with race meetings all over Europe, and every single weekend, his cars had to be racing. They had to be earning start money. Otherwise, they wouldn't have any money to get home. And that is why, and you'll see this in the book, extraordinary distances were traveled. HWM would have a race in Sweden, on the first of the month. On the eighth of the month, they'd have to be in Italy at Monza to do another race. Then it was back to Germany at the Nürburgring to do another race the following weekend. And they did, I think, during one season, the seasons were quite short in those days. They went from kind of March to October, April to October, really. And they did 26 race meetings in 28 weekends. Now, all this time, they had three mechanics. They had two broken down old trucks. One was a double-decker bus with the top shaved off. They could just squeeze three cars in that. The other was an ex-World War II truck, uh, which towed a, a, a petrol trailer because they needed um, the um, alcohol fuel that the racing cars ran on in those days. And these things fully laden, this little convoy of the broken down, the cut down double decker bus and the old World War II truck, carrying three cars, three exhausted mechanics and 100 gallons of fuel. They could just about do 30 miles an hour on the flat. Uh, when they had to go over the Alps, getting from the Nürburgring to Monza, uh, there weren't tunnels under the Alps in those days. They had to grind all the way up, probably getting down to walking pace. And then once they got there over the other side, they go down the other side, and there are several occasions, all um, logged in my book, of complete brake failure. And this transporter, overladen, going down, getting round the airpin bend somehow, and carrying on. Um, bouncing off the snowbanks, I think. Bouncing off the snowbanks, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing about start money, was you got your 200 quid per car or whatever the sum was. But you had to turn up, do practice, qualify for the race, 
and you had to do one lap of the race. You had to start the race and complete a lap, and then you got your 200 quid. If you didn't start the race, or if you broke down on the start line, no money. And as a result, some quite extraordinary things went on, where the car was completely crashed in practice. And it would start the race with its wheels all pointing in one direction, different directions, and it would chug round for the first lap just to complete a lap to get its start money. One other thing that John Heath tried <coughs> very successfully was that he would go to an organiser, race organiser, let's say uh, the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort, and there were no Dutch racing drivers running in Formula One doing great things. But the Dutch wanted a Dutchman in the race. So John would say, look, you're going to pay me 200 quid a car, but if you pay me 800 quid for my third car, you can put a Dutchman in it. Don't mind who it is. I'll even spray the car orange for you, if you like. That was, orange was the Dutch racing colour. And uh, so on several occasions during the year, you see cropping up surprising drivers in the number three car. Um, and part of the fun was actually finding out who these people were. At the back of volume two, I've got potted biographies of every single driver who raced an HWM in the 40s and 50s. And some of them were really obscure people. That time at Zandvoort, <coughs> um, actually John Heath only did the deal at the last minute. He didn't have time to paint the car orange. So he painted the bonnet orange. And this um, kind of middle-aged Dutch sports car driver was put in the car. And of course he was terribly slow in practice. And he came into the pit saying, this is absolutely disgraceful. You know, the car is shit and the brakes are no good and it has no power and the car is awful. So John beckoned to the young Sterling Moss, who was leading the team at that time, and said to Sterling, Sterling had just got uh, set a brilliant practice time, starting from the middle of the front row. And he beckoned to Sterling over and he said, Sterling, will you just do a couple of laps in that car? So Sterling went out and did a time within half a second of his own time. And the Dutchman went away. <laughs> um, there, were, there, were some, there were some big names. There were people who became big names were found and, and, and brought along by HWM, weren't they? Absolutely. I mean, Sterling Moss, for one, um, at the end of 1949, all Sterling had done, he was 19 years old, just 20, um, and he'd raced his own Formula 3 cars, uh, paid for by his dad. But clearly, here was a terrific talent. And of course, John Heath, always with an eye to the money, realised that if you hire a very young driver who's very keen, you don't have to pay him very much. So you get a bit of a bargain. And um, he hired the young Sterling Moss. HWM was the first professional drive that Sterling ever had. He raced for, for HWM for two years. Um, and there were some wonderful races. For example, HWM were running in those days a Formula 2 car. Formula 2 in those days was two litres, unsupercharged. And Formula 1 was one and a half litres supercharged or four and a half litres unsupercharged, a completely different level. Um, and the works Alfa Romeos and the works Ferraris were just mopping everything up. And there was a race where the works Alfa Romeos, Fangio and Farina, uh, were bound to finish first and second. Sterling finished third. Incredible in this little two-litre HWM, exactly like the car that's out there. <coughs> and uh, there was one moment F Farina was leading. He was the 1950 world champion. Fangio was in second place. They were going round nose to tail. And Farina, wonderful driver, famous for his laid-back style, which Sterling copied. But he was actually a shit as well. Not a nice man at all. And he was horrible on the circuit. He loved using his car as a bit of a weapon. And quite unreasonably, he used to do this uh, when he was lapping a car. Didn't need to. Car was keeping out of his way. But he would get a bit of pleasure out of almost pushing this car into the ditch. 
And when Farina and Fangio came up to lap Sterling, who was in third place but was about to be a lap down, Farina did this to Sterling. But he did it so sharply that he actually went, slightly went off the road at the next corner and Sterling overtook him again. <laughs> and obviously Farina then went ahead, followed by Fangio, who looked across at Sterling. Fangio was roaring with laughter. He thought the whole thing was brilliant. Well, of course, that's a lovely story. But uh, five, four years later, the works Mercedes team was Fangio and Moss. And, of course, they became teammates. And for Sterling, it all really happened with HWM. Another great name, Peter Collins, who went on, of course, to be a Grand Prix winner for Ferrari, tragically killed at the Nürburgring in 1958. Peter Collins' first drive, he'd done a bit of 500cc Formula 3, but his first proper drive was with HWM. And a lot of drivers got their first start with, a, with this little team, which was just up the road at Walton-on-Thames. It, it's just, a terribly romantic story. Really. It is, yeah. Just tell us a little bit about the cars. Were, were the, I mean, obviously they were hand-to-mouth and they couldn't afford uh, the, the finest componentry, but, but was there something about them? Were they, were they better done than... They weren't just um, bits bolted together. Were they, did they... Well... <coughs> They were. <laughs> they pretty much were. I mean, the, the reason why HWM had the success that they did was persistence. They were going on the continent, ra racing around Europe long before anybody else did, which is why I've, the, the subtitle of my book is the first team to fly the fag for Britain or something like, I can't remember what it is, but it's something like that. Um, <clears throat> Now, that's a slightly controversial thing to say because the historians among you will say, well, Napier, before the war, the first car to be painted British racing green, before World War I, I should say. Um, Sunbeam, who won the French Grand Prix in 1929. Um, ERA, of course, who did a lot of racing in Europe. Um, but they didn't do that much. When you look at it, it was only... H HWM was the first team actually to do so much and to work so hard and they did have reliability problems because if you're not spending enough money the cars aren't reliable <coughs> they were also working the cars much too hard and in the end they were sending on the little truck they would send a car back to Walton on Thames while the other two cars would go to the next race because they had to earn the money but a car with its engine completely blown or it had been crashed and wasn't raceable, that would be rushed back to Walton-on-Thames. Poor mechanic driving day and night got back to Walton-on-Thames, be more or less straightened out, quick engine change, and that would then have to go or catch the others up and get to Monza. And the thing that I found so amazing, and the, my book is full of these anecdotes, is how these mechanics coped, how they were able to work so relentlessly, working in Walton on Thames, driving um, often they, because A, they didn't have the budget from John Heath to stay at hotels, and B, because they didn't have any time, because they were running late, because maybe the transporter had broken down, or maybe the cars weren't finished, they would stop and just sleep underneath the trucks by the side of the road. Or maybe they didn't stop at all. Al Francis used to keep going. His two methods, Al Francis, the great um, mechanic, probably the most famous Formula, mechanic, Formula One mechanic of all, and worked with Sterling Moss through his great victories with Rob Walker, another local team. Um, Alf started with HWM. He'd never seen a racing car when he joined HWM, became their chief mechanic. And he would keep going um, by having a bottle of brandy in the cab with him. And he knew, because he'd done these roads so often, which villages had a village pump. And he would stop, might be three in the morning, he'd stop his truck, take a swig of brandy, douse his head under the village pump and carry on. Why, um, do you, why do you reckon they did this? Is it, was, was it because of 
something, a matter of having been in the army a few years earlier or something? Or? Funnily enough, yes. I mean, this was the late 40s and early 50s, and it was only half a dozen years after the end of the war, and I think that's absolutely right. It would not happen now. No. I mean, you see Formula One now with those immense pantechnicans and the, I mean, the mechanics even fly to the races and it's, there's a truck here to drive the truck and millions of pounds are spent on the coffee cups and, <laughs> you know, the menus. And Entertainment support, they call it. Uh, absolutely. Um, Eugene Dunn, who is a wonderful man, now 95, who was at the um, party we had for the book at... Um, uh, the RAC last week, he was saying that normally the mechanics had to stay in a very cheap hotel, if there was a hotel, whereas the drivers, and John Heath and particularly George Abacassis, would stay in a rather better hotel. Um, but Al Francis said that, um, that there was one place where they, they did actually get to a hotel in Italy. There was a race in Italy, and they managed to get there by late Thursday night practice was going to be Friday and Saturday, cars had to be got ready. But they were so exhausted, they hadn't slept since Tuesday when they left Walton. So they did find um, a, a sort of hotel, little rough place, and there was one double bed. So it was Alf and his fellow mechanic, Frank Nagel, and they thought, well, at least, thank God, there's a bed. So Frank Nagel got into the bed, and went to sleep immediately. Al Francis had a little bit of his brandy left, so he finished the brandy. And then he looked, it was very hot, so Frank had taken all his clothes off and gone to sleep. And Alf was about to get in the, of the bed and he looked down at Frank and he was covered with bed bugs. He was all bitten, the bed bugs crawling all over him. So Frank, in a rage, went down to, there wasn't a kind of reception or anything, it wasn't that sort of place, but he found somebody who was part of the family that owned the hotel and said, Alf, spoke, Alf was Polish and he spoke a lot of languages um, and he could swear in all of them. <laughs> and he said to this Italian, in so many words, he told the Italian what was going on, the Italian merely handed him, without speaking, handed him a flip gun. So you remember a flick down the things you used to... So uh, Alf just had to... went, Sprayed Frank, who was still asleep, sprayed himself and went to sleep. I mean, it's rather different from the world sure today is. when Lewis Hamilton is paid a quarter of a million pounds a week. Sure is. So the, 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 the racing history of HWM divides fairly neatly, doesn't it, between single seat and then the, the, the transition into sports cars. What did, can you summarise what they achieved? What were the, what were the big wins? What were the, what, what, where was the glory gathered? Well, to be brutally frank, there weren't very many big wins. Um, what they achieved was staying afloat, getting to all the races, running in the races, um, often providing surprises. Um, I mean, the, the, my book has a painting by Michael Turner on the cover of each volume. And the picture on the front of volume one is of Sterling Moss and Lance Macklin in the two HWMs in the um, Genoa Grand Prix, which was an Italian non-championship race, but pretty important. All the Fer works Ferraris were there. And... It shows Sterling Moss and Lance Macklin leading the Ferraris. Uh, Genoa is a, um, a circuit rather like Monaco, it, on the sea and it goes up into the hills. And just that was an extraordinary achievement. Um, you can see Ascari and Villarese in the works Ferraris behind them. And they were on the front row, but somehow Sterling and Lance, even though the HWMs had a pre-selector gearbox, you'll see in the one outside, gear change on the um, was a gear lever on the steering column and then the left hand pedal is not strictly speaking a clutch you 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 push you pre-select the gear and then when you want it you you punch the the, uh, yeah. uh, the the left hand pedal and actually it's quite difficult to get a car with pre-selected gearbox off the line fast 
It's not like dropping the clutch and spinning the wheels. But somehow both Sterling and Lance got away from the works Ferraris. And although the Ferraris then passed Lance Macklin and got into second and third places, Sterling remained in the lead on this very twisty circuit, driving absolutely brilliantly. And, um, of course, in the end, the car broke, and the Ferraris finished one and two, as they always did, and Sterling got nothing, apart from the start money, of course. Uh, there was another race at Monza, <coughs> um, which Sterling wrote in his diary, that today is the day I learned about slipstreaming. You know, Monza's a very fast track, and Villarese in his Ferrari, uh, Sterling was able to fasten on the back of it, uh, in its slipstream, and Sterling said, working off the rev counter, that when in practice, when he was on his own, he was able to pull 132 miles an hour. Tucked into the slipstream of the Ferrari, he was pulling just over 140, mm -hmm. which the car couldn't do on its own. And there was this little upstart, this little underdog, um, at Monza, the home of Ferrari, with, he was stuck behind a works Ferrari, a red Ferrari, a little green, HWM and the crowd, the Tifosi, normally cheering for Ferrari, they were cheering for this little green chap. Quite right. Quite um, right. So they, they, there were odd victories um, in, in some of the smaller races, but what they really did was impress the whole of the motor racing establishment with how they were able to achieve so much on so little. Mm, I see. And I think, uh, am I right in thinking that the single seater? era came to an end because other single seaters got vastly better. That's and absolutely that, right. Did that drive the Yeah. The I mean you, you asked earlier and I didn't quite answer the question about what were the what what were the cars made of. Uh, they were very simple. They just had two um, steel tubes for the chassis with cross members and then hung on it were bits which mainly came from production cars. Um, I mean, the front suspension on the 1950 HWM, like the one I've got, um, and mine has gone into a second life. It was rebuilt in America and has a Chevrolet engine which produces about 420 brake horsepower. But it still has its original front suspension, which actually comes off a 1948 standard 12. <laughs> John Heath was using any bits he could find. And by the time we got to 53, 54, motor racing was getting a bit more sophisticated. Um, and even the, the British teams were getting uh, a bit better. Um, Cooper were coming through with a very light Formula 2 car, Cooper Bristol, which was doing well. And gradually, the HWMs were no longer able to, to, to cope. They ran one Formula One car in 1954. And those of you who know your 50s history will know that the French Grand Prix in 1954 was this extraordinary race where suddenly Mercedes-Benz came back into racing. In the middle of the season, suddenly they appeared with these incredible straight eight fuel-injected, streamlined, all-enveloping cars. And instantly, they were winning everything. Um, and that was the last Formula One race that the HWM Works team ever did. And I looked up the practice times, and Lance Macklin, who was an excellent driver, uh, his qualifying time was 10 seconds slower than the Mercedes. And that shows how HWM, sadly, uh, could no longer cope. But they then had a second life because they moved into sports car racing. Now, John Heath, as I think I've already indicated, was pretty parsimonious. Um, I mean, the mechanics used to say that if he saw a used split pin on the floor, he would say, of the, of the workshop, he'd say, what's that doing there? That could be used again. And it was getting quite difficult to sell old single-seater HWMs uh, because they were no longer particularly competitive. And he had three of the 1951 single-seaters left. So he simply took... The, he, nothing was ever thrown away. He had all the bits. So he simply took them to pieces and used the chassis frame again 
put a wider body on it, put a Jaguar engine in it because that was the current um, top sports car engine and was actually quite cheap to buy because it was a production engine and built the HWM Jaguar sports car and that was very successful and they actually built four of what I've called the Series 1, uh, three HWM Jaguars and then there was a fourth which they actually sold without engine to uh, a chap called Johnny Marshall who had a garage which is, I passed it tonight, uh, those of you who know locally, do, some of you may know there's a roundabout um, on the way from, Fel, uh, I suppose, Feltham uh, to um, Walton. It's called Marshall's Roundabout. It's always been called Marshall's Roundabout, but it's called that because the garage on the roundabout used to be run by a man called Johnny Marshall. And he bought the fourth, on the be behalf of a customer, he bought the fourth of the four... Series 1 HWM sports cars and uh, put a, a, his customer's Cadillac engine in it. And that is the car you can see outside. So the first four <coughs> HWM sports cars were roughly the shape of that car outside, although that's the only one with a Cadillac engine. Because that worked pretty well, John Heath then decided that they should actually build some proper sports cars from scratch. They built two uh, the idea was to build more for, um, for customers. George Abacassis had the first, raced it very successfully. And John Heath said, I fancy doing the Mealy Melia, as you know, the incredibly dangerous, grueling, thousand-mile race all around Italy. John had done quite a lot of racing, but by 52, he really stopped racing and was pretty much uh, running the team. But he wanted to get back into racing just to do the Mini Melia. And George Abacassis actually tried to dissuade him and said, look, I don't really think you should be doing this race. You'll be a bit in over your head. Uh, anyway, Heath said, I'm doing the Mini Melia, went and did it in 1956 with the second of the new HWM sports cars. And it's a long story, but you can read it in the book. Uh, it's an extraordinary story because he then, he'd now married again, um, but he happened to bump into his first wife a few weeks before, said, I'm just off to Italy to do the Mili Melia. Uh, I don't really want to do it, actually. Got a kind of bad feeling about it. And his wife said, John, for God's sake, Amelia, Amelia, you know, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. He said, oh, well, you know, I've, I've kind of, I've, I've got into it now and my wife's bringing all her friends and, you know, we, we, I'm, I'm going to do it. The night before the race, he wrote out a will and I've got a facsimile of the will in the book. We've managed to find the little two-page will written out by hand. And the will starts off Due to the hazards of motor racing, I hereby set out my last will and testament. And he scribbled it out on a piece of paper over supper the night before the race, got two friends to sign it, to uh, witness it, and shoved it in his jacket pocket. And then next morning, half past three in the morning, because with the Mealy Mealy, you start one car every minute. And the big number on the side of the car, the racing number, says what time you're leaving. And I think he was 5'4", five, 5'5", five, so he was leaving at quarter to six in the morning. Put on his racing overalls, went off to the start, leaving his jacket over the chair by the bed. And it was a pretty grim-looking morning, but it wasn't actually raining. But about an hour into the race, it started to sheet with rain. And I've got a great quote in the book from Dennis Jenkinson, who was going with Sterling Moss. He'd won... The Mealy Mealy with Sterling Moss, of course, that famous race for Mercedes in 1955. But in 56, he was going with Moss again in the Maserati. And Jenkinson's description of driving at 130, 140, 150 miles an hour through this torrential rain on a public road with banks of spectators under umbrellas, sort of tunnel of humanity, <coughs> 
extraordinary. And anyway, Heath, to cut a long story short, um, went off the road uh, about seven miles north of Ravenna, and he was very <coughs> badly injured. Um, he was taken by hospital, uh, by ambulance to, to Ravenna Hospital, and he died on the Wednesday. Well, Heath was such a powerful character, and he had really driven that team. George was very charming with his long cigarette holder, very good racing driver, but it was John Heath's energy which drove that place and persuaded those exhausted mechanics to keep working and really made that team going all over Europe. And as soon as he was killed, the stuffing went out of the team and it pretty much stopped. George Abacassis uh, stopped racing there and then. He never raced again, did a couple of hill climbs, that's about it, but he never raced again. And the cars continued, the sports cars, continued to earn some money because, of course, money still had to be earned. What they did was they hired them out to uh, wealthy young drivers um, through the rest of 56 and 57, and then they sold the cars, and that was pretty much the end. George Abacassis continued to run HWM. I should have mentioned right at the beginning, HWM stands for Hersham and Walton Motors because John Heath's original um, garage before the war was at Hersham and then when they got together it became HWM, Hersham and Walton Motors. George Abacassis continued to run HWM and because uh, he's quite a character, he was a great character, there are lots of stories about what happened to HWM after they stopped racing and some of them are quite funny. Uh, but George, in 1958, was joined by a very clever young man who had been actually the sales manager of Aston Martin, the manufacturer, when he was only 24. Uh, he then wanted to get out of Aston Martin because they wanted to... They who wanted was he? To, what was his name? Uh, well, this was yeah. Mike Harting. Oh, okay. And Mike Harting uh, invested in the business, so Mike Harting and George ran the business, George retired, Mike bought him out, and Mike Harting is still uh, the chairman of HWM. The CEO is his son, Andrew Harting, who's in the room somewhere. The room, yeah. uh, Guy Jenner is the managing director, and the company is still hugely successful. In fact, Guy Jenner told me that of all the Aston Martin dealers in the world, they are the second most successful after Beverly Hills and just ahead of Tokyo. Fantastic. So the, the company's still going well. I wanted to tell you another thing about George Abacassis. Um, as well, he was a very good racing driver. And so as well as um, obviously driving the HWMs, he also drove for some time for Aston Martin. And to show you the sort of laid back chap he was, and he had been very brave in the war, um, and he sort of carried on this devil-may-care attitude into his racing in peacetime. And he's racing for Aston Martin. Aston Martin, as a lot of you may know, had a very ferocious team manager called John Wire, who ruled the team with a rod of iron. And would, they called him Death Ray, because he would look at you with a <laughs> beady eye if you'd done anything wrong. And George had a huge accident at Goodwood, out at St Mary's. And, of course, the car didn't come round, and John Wire, his, his sort of beady eye became beadier. And finally, George, with his crash helmet under his arm, came trudging in across the fields from St Mary's. And John Wire met him in the pit lane and gave him the most enormous dressing down. And George said, I don't know, crash my car, get a bollocking, crash my aeroplane, they gave me a DFC. <laughs> <laughs> the book, one of the great things about the book, as I sort of alluded to, is that you, you go a lot into the, into the lives of, the, of, the, of the, the main characters and indeed the minor characters. Yeah. Did, you get, did you just get to the point where you felt you knew them and you wanted to know more about them? What, what was that about? Well, I was very lucky. Um, I mean, John Heath, 
uh, obviously died in 1956 um, when I was 12 years old. Um, so I was doing it all after the event. George died, I think, in the... Well, he died in his early 70s. Um, but the people I was able to meet were extraordinarily helpful. I was very, very lucky that um, through one of... John Heath had two daughters, uh, one of whom I'm delighted to say is here tonight. Both of them were hugely helpful to me. They couldn't have been more friendly. Um, I was kind of probing around in their father's fairly complicated private life. Um, but one of his daughters introduced me to his, uh, his first wife. Uh, sadly, she died, um, oh, 10 years or more ago. But I was able to meet her. I sat drinking a cup of tea with her in her sitting room. And she was wonderfully uh, open um, and good-humoured and frank about her life with John, which can't have been very easy. John, um, at the Swiss Grand Prix in 1950, met a 20-year-old model. Um, he was walking up the stairs and she was coming down the stairs. And that was pretty much the end of John Heath's marriage. Um, they did... Um, continue for the um, John and Diana continued for a bit but he had this affair and in the end everybody in motor racing knew about it and uh, the, the marriage was at an end but she was wonderful um, her two daughters were wonderful um, did, did you find you liked the did you find you liked these people the, the, the main characters oh absolutely fascinating and I mean I liked their faults as well as their virtues yeah, yeah. you know they were yeah, yeah. Um, they certainly weren't cardboard characters they no. were very much human human beings with feet of clay um, uh, I mean uh, George Mike Harting as I say the, the man who's now uh, the chairman of HWM who adored George but he said George um, George wasn't in it for the money and HWM, when Mike Harting arrived, wasn't actually making any money. He said, all George really wanted out of life was a good lunch. <laughs> and in the works at about quarter to one, uh, George would come into Mike Harting's office and say, <coughs> nosebag time, Boise. <laughs> and they'd then go to the pub and uh, probably have quite a long lunch. Because people did in those days. Yeah. But one of the things that HWM did, um, they, they were a very good Aston Martin dealer. Uh, they also sold other cars. And Lance Macklin, who had been, he was probably the most loyal HWM racer um, in the early 50s. He, when he'd retired from racing, um, was working for Fassel Vega, the French um, supercar company, I suppose they'd be called now in Paris. He was their sales manager and they wanted a dealer in um, England. So of course Lance got on to George, his old friend, and George became, HWM became the, the Fassel Vega importers. Um, and there are various stories, I won't go into too many, but um, one customer um, wanted a Fassel Vega. The only one they had in the showroom was bright red. And George said, well, that's all right. Um, you know, if you'd like a blue one, as the customer thought he said, we'll get one flown over. So the next week, there was a blue Fassel Vega, and the man was very happy with it. Unfortunately, he had a small accident about three weeks later. And underneath the blue paint, you could clearly see red paint. <laughs> and he went back to George. He says, absolutely, it's graceful. You said... Well, caught up with the table. You said you're going to have another one flown over. George said, no, no, dear boy. I said I'd get it blown over. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> and another one. Um, there they were selling these Fassel Vegas. And they were at the motor show, and they had two of the latest Fassel Vegas, the Fassel 2, the Fassel 2. They had two of them on the stand, both of which course they'd had to pay for pay fossils for and they arrived at the motor show on Tuesday and uh, to be greeted by the news that overnight Fassel Vega had gone bust 
And this was obviously quite a problem because these, their money was tied up in these cars. And Mike Harty was a wonderful salesman. Still is, probably. Um, <clears throat> Mike Harty said to George, don't worry, I'll sort this out. And at half past ten, he sold the first of them to Lionel Bart. Now, Lionel Bart, if you haven't heard of him, he was a very successful um, writer of uh, stage musicals. He'd made millions and was very famous at the time. So Lionel bought, Bart bought one of them. And then at quarter to 12, he sold one to Ringo Starr. <laughs> and after that, they, he, George said, well, look, we've got no cars to sell. Let's go and have lunch. <laughs> and they went... And, Mike Harting said, I remember that lunch. It went on until quarter to seven. <laughs> but the next day, George had to deliver this fassel to, to Ringo Starr. And Ringo Starr lived not far from here in St. George's Hill in the most enormously grand house, huge. And I mean, he'd come onto the stand looking like a scruffy beetle. Um, but there he, he was in this enormous palatial great house. And George went round to deliver this thing. And when he got back, he said to, said to Mike Harting, bloody hell, Boise, if I'd known what, that was what drumming got you, I'd have joined the regimental band. <laughs> <laughs> right, now there are two, two more things I need to ask you and yeah. before we give these people a, an opportunity to buy your book at a, at a, at a remarkable knockdown price of 100 Absolutely. Um, one is, we need to hear about your car. Right. And why it's called the Stove Bolt Special. Right. And who the drivers were. And just, just a bit of a rundown on your car. And then we need to hear just some more about the actual business of writing a book, how long it takes, how, you know, how much you work every day, that sort of stuff. Right. Well, um, it, it, it seems a bit egotistical to talk about my car, but there were 19 HWMs built. Not very many. Um, 17 of them still exist. But the reason why my book is in two volumes is that the first volume tells the story of the team and all the anecdotes that I've been telling and all the tragedies, um, John Heath's death, all the hot difficulties, excitements, tragedies, triumphs. It's all in volume one. But rather than load down volume one, with all the information I had about each individual car. Volume two goes through all of those 19 cars. And there is a separate section on every car, um, which was fascinating for me because it meant I had to research the history, all the owners, all the races that each of those cars had done. And it was made quite difficult by the fact that John Heath didn't believe in putting chassis numbers on his cars. One of the reasons why he didn't believe in it was because the Inland Revenue <laughs> would come looking and they'd say, well, this is a new car. John would say, no, no, I, I built that in 1948. There was purchase tax in those days, all sorts of complications. So John never had chassis numbers, or if he did have chassis numbers, they were bent. So that added to the amount of detective work I had to do. But there is a bit about every single one of those cars. Then there's a section about every track that they all raced on. And some of the uh, European tracks were very obscure. You know, you would have never heard of them. I hadn't heard of all of them. And then the third bit in that volume two is about all the drivers. Now, the easiest bit for me to write, of course, was the history of my car because I knew it already. Um, but it did have a pretty curious history. It started as a 1950, one of the 1950 works cars, the three works cars. Sterling Moss drove all three. Um, anybody who's got a 1950 car says, well, I've got the ex-Sterling Moss car. Well, actually, they were all driven by Sterling because they swapped the cars around. Um, and my car, actually, was the one that Sterling crashed at Naples. He was leading the Naples Grand Prix, and a back marker moved across on him and he hit a tree, and um, obviously no seat belts or anything like that in those days, and his face smashed forward onto the top of the cockpit and knocked all his front teeth out. And um, 
he's worn false front teeth ever since. And when I bought the car, I rang him up and I said, Sterling, I've just bought the car that you crashed in the Naples Grand Prix. And he said, jolly good show, boy. Have a look under the seat. You'll probably find my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, it had been radically rebuilt since then. It went from HWM to a, um, uh, a Swiss privateer. It then was bought by 20th Century Fox, the film company, because they had decided, as film companies, Hollywood film companies do about once every 10 years, they would make the ultimate motor racing film about Grand Prix racing. Uh, it was called The Racers, although in this country, for some reason, it was released under the um, name Such Men Are Dangerous. God knows what. <laughs> And, of course, I got a copy of the film. Of it's course. pretty frightful. But, of course, my car is in it. And the hero of this film was Kirk Douglas. Anybody remember Kirk Douglas? Definitely. Great, great Definitely. movie star. Um, he had to be driving my car in the film. Uh, and the plot said, this shows how ridiculous it was, that before the race, Kirk Douglas, the big motor racing hero is in the pits and a very beautiful girl comes up to him and he starts chatting her up and the girl, this shows how ridiculous it was, has a poodle on a lead in the pits. Uh, well, the race starts and there's Kirk Douglas. It's Monaco. They, they, didn't, they actually had to shut down Monaco, Monte Carlo, and put on a bogus Monte Carlo Grand Prix. That's how much money uh, they were paying, they were spending. And there's Kirk Douglas leading the race. The poodle is on one side of the track. It sees a cat on the other side of the track. <laughs> it runs across the road. Now, what Kirk Douglas could have done is killed the dog, but that wouldn't have made a very good story. So instead, he avoids the dog and has a huge accident, <laughs> which was my car. Um, and when 20th Century Fox also used... Am I going on too long? No, no. 20th Century Fox also bought a couple of Ferraris and a couple of Maseratis to use in this race, plus my HWM. They then flew all five cars to Hollywood um, and finished off making the film. And when the movie came out, there was a chap up in Seattle, in Washington State, who raced an Allard, a chap called Tom Carstens, immaculate Allard, black, with white wheels, those are always his racing colours. And he went to his local cinema and he saw the film and he thought, that little car before it crashed, that looks, that looks kind of good. I, I wouldn't mind running a car like that. So he rang up 20th Century Fox, asked to be put through to the props department and he said, um, have you still got any of those cars that you used in the film The Racers? And the props man looked at him. Yeah, yeah, we've got five. Uh, two uh, Fazaris and uh, <laughs> two Mozzatitis and one... Uh, I don't know what the other one is. <coughs> so Tom Carson said, well, I'd like to buy the other one. And the man said, what do you think we are, second-hand car dealers? <laughs> We're not going to fiddle around selling cars here and there. You'll have to buy the lot. And I won't take a penny less than $2,000 for them. <laughs> <laughs> So Tom Carson's ended up <coughs> with <coughs> two Ferraris, two Maseratis, and the HWM. He sold the Ferraris and the Maseratis at a huge profit and used the money to convert the HWM into uh, a cycle-winged sports racer, which still followed all the shape of the HWM, but he put in it a small-block Chevrolet V8. And the small-block Chevy had only just come out I mean, it's been one of the most long-lived and successful racing engines over the last half century. But it had just come out. It had been used in drag racing, and it had been used um, on oval, in oval racing, but it had never been in, a, in a, a road racing car before. So my HWM was the first car to race um, as a, a, with a small-block um, Chevy engine. And without boring you with the history, all of which is in the book, it then continued to race through various owners um, and raced quite successfully. Uh, and 
in the end, I'm sorry this story is going on so long, but I loved this car as a kid. I'd seen a picture of it in an American magazine, and I loved it. And in 1999, I happened to be in, in uh, a racing car prep shop up in the Midlands, and sitting rather forlornly in the corner was this car with all its bits off. And I looked at it, and I said, my God, that's the Stove Bolt Special. And the guy, the guy around the shop said, yeah, yeah, it is. I said, well, who owns that? Oh, it belongs to Murray Smith up out in New York. He sent it over. He wants some work done on it. I thought, wow. So on the way home, back down the M6, I stopped at the services, and I rang Murray Smith. I got his phone number. It was in New York. It was sort of 9 o'clock in the morning. He was taking his kid to school. I just loved this car. So I said to him, uh, you've got the stove bolt special. He said, yes. I said, well, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, I think I'm probably going to sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew I was kind of lost. I mean, it, Just anyway, I got it, and that was 20 years ago. The, where, where did it acquire the name in the film? It didn't acquire the name in the film. It acquired the name after the film. I mean, when it made the film, it still had its original Alter engine. Oh, I see. It was only after uh, Tom when Carstens the... had bought it, he put in the Chevy engine. And that's and, when it became the Stove and, Bolt And it, it was called the Stove Bolt Special because Stove Bolt was a name used by American hot rodders to describe, actually not the V8, but the old straight six Chevy. Yeah. The valve chest but at the side. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, they had what we'd probably call boiler bolts holding on the, the side um, uh, covers. And the Americans call them stove bolts. So that's it. Right, last thing. How many words? How long? What, what was your regime for writing it? And then we're going to give these fine people a chance to buy one. Regime? Yeah. I mean, that sounds like, well, how, how often you should take a laxative. <laughs> Perhaps you didn't need to do that. Um, no, I, I, I think um, you, you hear about authors who say, you know, I get up at 6.30, have a cup of coffee, do 2,000 words before breakfast, have my wheaty bangs, do 3,000 words before lunch. I am not like that. Um, I start with, the thing that is really undisciplined about me is that although I researched this book for a long time, I wasn't really researching a book, I was just finding out stuff about HWMs. And then I started chapter one, but I was still finding out stuff about HWMs. And by the time I'd got to 1953, I suddenly met somebody whose father had been a friend of a mechanic in 1951. So I had to go back to that chapter and rewrite that. It was hoped. I was all over the place. I see. Um, and the big mistake I made, I mean, if I ever write a book like this again, and my wife says I'm not allowed to, but if I ever do, um, what I will do is do the photo research at the same time as I do the research, because photographs make or mar a book like this. And we've managed to get... 600, more than 600 pictures in this book. Part of that, I have to say, is down to Evro's wonderful book editor, who also does the job of helping you find pictures. That's a chap called Mark Hughes. Uh, but basically, I had to find all these pictures. Um, and I did that, this awful photo research process, after I'd finished writing the book, which, of course, was quite wrong. I should have been doing it either before or during. Uh, and that's part of the reason why it's taken kind of three and a half years. Um, I can't tell you how you write a book because um, more organised, more disciplined people would do it better than me. All I can tell you is that if you're passionate enough about the subject, it's actually a lot of fun. It's very hard work. But, uh, and it, it, I may say, because the publisher's at the back of the room, you don't earn any money writing books. No, 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 you really no. don't. It's got to be because you want to do it. And um, I've learnt a lot about HWMs, and I thought I knew all about them. I didn't know anything about them, really. I've met a lot of delightful people. Um, I don't know of a boring 
HWM owner. Uh, they're all fascinating. We've got one in this room who's a barrister who drives his HWM on the road, I'm delighted to say, so do I. Um, and I've been trying to persuade him to drive his HWM on the road wearing his, um, his wig. <laughs> but um, We all want to see that. I, I haven't persuaded him yet. Uh, there's another HWM owner, I won't mention his name, but he's a sweet man, and he lives in a porter cabin in a muddy field um, in Dorset. Um, and he didn't want his name to be in the book, but he was very happy for me to go down and look at his car and talk to, talk to him about it. All the HW owners have been brilliant. Um, there's one in Australia. Uh, there are um, two in Germany who live five miles from each other and didn't know each other. One has the first HWM, the other has the last HWM, the wonderful Red Game Coupe. Uh, there's one in Belgium, there's one in Arizona, very wealthy chap. Uh, he's wealthy because his grandfather invented Campbell's condensed soup. Um, they're all a very interesting lot and they're all lovely people. I don't think you can own an HWM if you're boring. Fantastic. <laughs> well, there, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you, uh, if you want to know more than that, and uh, believe it or not, there's, there's vastly more in the book. Um, you know what to do. But uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, let's say thank you to Simon Taylor for a fantastic presentation. Well, let's have some questions for me. Can we have some questions? Yeah, we're going to have some questions, but the thing I've learned is let's bring back the long lunch. Suit <laughs> <laughs> yes. me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? Right, yes, sir. Hold on till you've got the microphone, everyone else can hear. By the way, the uh, lionesses are winning 2 0. Oh, very good. That'll put the kiss of death on them, won't it? <laughs> right, Mr. Taylor. Yeah. Could you please say something about the GT car, the only proper road-going car, I gather, absolutely. which Abacass has had? Is that one of the 19? It, it absolutely is one of the 19, and I was driving it in Germany uh, a few weeks ago for a feature. Here's another plug. Um, I've just done a feature for Classic and Sports Car, the issue that's on sale next week, about the first HWM and the last, because, as I said, they both live in Germany, close to each other. So I was driving the, the first HWM, which they called the Streamliner. It was a full-width racing car. And the last one, which was the Coupe, um, fascinating car. When John Heath was killed, um, there was a chassis left over, which they hadn't completed. And George had this idea that he would build the ultimate Jaguar-powered GT car. Now, you've got to remember, this was in 1957, so it was four years before the E-Type. Um, it was at a time when I don't think the XK150 had quite arrived, the 140, which was actually a fairly dated car with its solid back axle. Um, uh, most of them had drum brakes, uh, and it looked a bit old-fashioned by then. Um, and George drew uh, the GT car of his dreams. It actually looked pretty frightful. Um, but the picture that he drew is in my book. But he then showed it to Frank Feely, who Aston Martin owners among you will know, was the wonderful stylist at Aston Martin. Frank Feely was a friend of George's, and Frank Feely said, I think you'd better let me just have a go at this, George. <laughs> and Frank Feely turned it into a fabulous looking car. It, it is a remarkably beautiful car. It's, it's a great looking car. I, I've seen the proofs of the story. Oh, you have, right. And, okay. Uh, well, um, there are fulsome photographs of this car. It, um, but it took so long to build and cost so much money that George christened it George's Folly. <laughs> and um, he actually, once he got it, the fun for George was having it built. Once he got it built, he kind of lost interest in it. And it was sold after not very long. Um, and it went through various owners. And it now belongs to a delightful... Um, fairly elderly gentleman in Germany and his younger son, his son, who's much younger than him, obviously. And father and son, they really enjoy this car. They've done about 18,000 road miles in it. Uh, and it's, it's terrific. How does it drive? It drives brilliantly. I expected it to be like a sports racing 
you know, like a D-type with a roof on it. And I thought it was going to be very noisy um, and uncomfortable. It's actually not. There's quite a lot of sound deadening. Um, it steers beautifully. Um, there's a bit of heat. It was a very hot day in Germany, and you, you get a bit of heat inside. But it's not ferociously noisy. It's quite comfortable, and it goes like hell. Mm. So it, 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 and, of course, there is only one. I mean, how lovely to own a car that is as sexy as that, and you know that you will never meet another one. Another question. Any more, ladies and gentlemen? Must be more than... Yeah, there's one in the middle, Steve. Yeah, one over here first. Hello, uh, Simon. Uh, you um, talked really about Fassel Vega and a little bit about Aston Martin uh, as the um, dealer franchises they had. Did they have any other interesting or exotic cars that they sold at any one time? They, they absolutely did. I mean, after the war, when HWM first started up, I said earlier they were selling Morris 8s and Ford Populars. Well, they were. But they also, uh, because of George Abacassus's contacts, in the racing world, um, they did do quite a nice sideline in buying and selling second-hand racing cars. They then, later on, uh, they had, as well as Aston Martin, they had, as you say, the Fassel Vega dealership. When Fassel Vega went bust, uh, they, they had the um, Iso Grifo concession. Uh, they also, and Mike Harting tells this story brilliantly, and it's in the book, um, for some reason, HWM decided it might be a good idea to become the importers of the DAF. Now, as you remember, DAF was a rather silly little car from Holland, uh, which had its transmission by rubber bands. And uh, obviously, HWM thought this was going to be the thing. So they started importing them in great numbers and then found them rather difficult to sell. And of course, when they came in, they had to pay the import duty on them. And as they, every time they sold some, more kept coming in, more import duty had to be paid. And HWM had a bit of a cash flow problem. And Mike Hardy said it was perfectly all right because we found this little chap who um, seemed to have lots of money. And he said to us, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll buy all the DAFs off you. And then when you're in money again, you can buy them all back again. <laughs> And Mike said, terrific. And that's what happened. I mean, obviously, when HWM bought them back from this little chap, uh, they did have to pay a bit extra. So the little chap made his, uh, made his cut. But um, Mike said he was absolutely honest. You know, just a shaken hand, fine. That little man's name was Bernie Eccleston. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, hold on. I think, Mike, you're the next That's there. So. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Simon, the engine used in the original cars, that was um, Geoffrey Taylor's? It was indeed. And it was an Alta engine. Hmm. Uh, Geoffrey Taylor, another. I mean, it's extraordinary how many specialist motor racing companies there have been all the way around here. You know, Cooper, Connaught, HWM, Alta... Uh, Jeffrey Taylor started um, Alta uh, just down here on the bypass, I think. Um, and they were building cars before the war, racing cars and a few road cars. And they all had a four-cylinder twin overhead camshaft engine, both supercharged and unsupercharged. And George, in his successful racing before the war, raced a single-seater um, supercharged Alta. And so there was a good relationship between Jeffrey Taylor and HWM. And so from the beginning, I mean, the first HWM, the car I mentioned, the 1948 car, the, the so-called Streamliner, that, was, that actually had not only an Alta engine, but had an Alta chassis. So it was really not much more than a rebodied Alta. Um, and they continued to use the Alta engine. However... Um, John Heath did his own development on the Alta engine. Jeffrey really just sold them the engines. And by 1952-53, uh, the engine was virtually an HWM engine. I mean, they changed the chain drive for the camshafts to gear drive. Um, they'd altered uh, the pistons and the conrods. They'd changed quite a lot. 
So it was almost an HWM engine. But still, it never really had enough power. And by the time HWM were getting 140 brake horsepower out of their two-litre four-cylinder engine, Ferrari were getting 180, 190 out of theirs. Uh, and that's why, really, they needed to make the change to the Jaguar-powered sports cars. Another question, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure there was one more. Yes, sir. Um, I think my dad drew the short straw and he delivered Lionel Bart's car. But, <laughs> but I was under the impression those were brought in under the head of international, intercontinental cars, not HWMs. They started uh, the firm called Inter Intercontinental Cars when they started with Fassel Vega because otherwise they were worried there might have been a clash uh, between um, Fassel Vega and, and Aston Martin. Um, they didn't want to us upset Aston Martin because David Brown, who owned Aston Martin, um, happened to be, by then, George Amicassis's father-in-law. George had gone off with Angela Brown, who was... Uh, hit, well, this is another story. I'm not going to go into it because it's too long. Probably but, best not to. Um, you'll have to read the book, but uh, <laughs> Angela Brown was at finishing school in Switzerland. And there is a photograph, which unfortunately I couldn't get hold of, otherwise it would have been in the book. Um, it's a photograph from the 1950 Swiss Grand Prix of this schoolgirl in the HWM pit. She obviously got the weekend off from her finishing school in Switzerland to go and watch the Swiss Grand Prix and somehow ended up in the HWM pit. Well, in 1956, uh, she became the second Mrs. Amicassis. One more question, maybe, ladies and gentlemen. All oh, right, OK, right at the back. Thank you. I need some exercise tonight, so there you go, sir. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Mike, Mike took my question about the Alta engines, but we had a couple of weeks ago uh, talk on Connaughts, and came out of that that uh, Connaught got the sole concession for the engine. Presumably that was 53 or 54 when uh, for a two-litre engine. Uh, but didn't George also race the Alters in the 40s? I believe he was in the 48 Grand Prix, um, British Grand Prix in an Alter. He, he, he raced the single-seater Alter. The one he raced before the war very successfully. He still had it after the war. Um, and so in 1946-47, um, he was still racing the single-seater Alter. Um, and also, HWM bought two of the Alter sports cars and they raced those as well. Um, but once, uh, G George actually had a disastrous relationship with um, Alta GP1. After the war, Geoffrey Taylor decided he was going to make a really serious Grand Prix car, a Formula One car, effectively. And George said, fine, I'll order one. And the first one, they only ever made three, GP1, GP2, GP3. Well, GP1 was ordered by George, um, in, I think, early 47, the car didn't appear until mid to late 48. And it was a disaster. I think George, from memory, he raced it seven times and I think retired six times. Um, it never really worked very well. Uh, the engine was fundamentally the same engine, but with two-stage supercharging. And in those days, as you would remember, Formula One, Grand Prix racing, they called it then, was one and a half litre supercharged or four and a half litre unsupercharged. So the engine was still fundamentally the same, but um, developed to produce a lot more power. But the car was just endlessly unreliable. And uh, that car, um, in the end, because as I've said, HWM never throw anything away, the car sat, Alta GP1, sat in a corner at Walton on Thames until John found a way of turning it into a Jaguar-powered sports car and, and selling it. Ladies and gentlemen, Simon Taylor and Steve Proctor. Thank you. Thank you both gentlemen for a fantastic...